good. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Job. Who said Merry Christmas over there? One of my granddaughters. Grandson. Yeah, good. I like it. Um, thanks again to the kids who did the reading. That's nothing easy to do, right? Especially when we got it all confused. They did a good job, though. Um, today and uh, tomorrow, we all celebrate in our country um, with the giving of gifts and getting together with family and all that stuff, right? Yes. One of my favorite times of year. But um, during the first Christmas, a, a lot more was going on. Some things that maybe you wouldn't just recognize from the way we celebrate it now. Now, first of all, God was incarnate. God was coming in the flesh. And that's no small thing, right? And so when reading the stories of the of the you know the virgin birth and the and the baby being born in the manger, that's all beautiful. But like I said, there's more going on. There's a spiritual battle that was going on as well. And uh, believe it or not, I'll try to keep this PG, but Satan was actually trying to have the baby killed. Uh, you may remember the story about evil King Herod. And how the uh, Magi came and uh, they dropped by to see Herod on the way to pay their respects. And uh, they said, there's a king being born. He's like, what? And they're like, yeah, you know, we followed this star. And uh, he says, well, hey, on your way back, once you uh, drop back by and let me know where it is. So an angel speaks to the Magi and they don't do that. They take a different way. But Herod was enraged. And so at the birth of Christ, he sent soldiers out to kill every child under the age of two, every boy. Um, but an angel then, of course, warns Joseph, and Joseph takes baby Emmanuel, Jesus, off to Africa. And he stays there until he's told that it's safe to come back. And we don't know a lot about what happened then, but we do know that some years later, Jesus is in the temple and he's teaching, and he becomes a young man at the age of 12 and blew all the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, the teachers of the time, away with his amazing knowledge of the scriptures. We don't see much more or hear much more about him until he's 30 years old. But there is still this spiritual battle going on. It's a colossal battle. And what it happens is Jesus begins his earthly ministry and it leads up to a baptism at the Jordan River. As he's going up to be baptized by John, what we call now John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer, John says, I'm not going to baptize you. I'm not worthy to baptize you. You should be baptizing me. But Jesus says, let it be so. And so John the Baptizer baptizes Jesus in the Jordan River. At the moment when he came out of the water, the Holy Spirit came on him and, and it landed on him like a dove. We don't know exactly what that means, but we know the Holy Spirit comes upon him. And the voice from heaven says this, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. Roughly translated into English, This is my child, my Son, and I'm very proud of him. At that moment, something happens, I think probably beyond what we can understand. I believe that the Scriptures would lead me to tell you that for 30 years Satan was still looking for this boy, for this king. And he didn't really know which one it was. He knew he was there, but at the moment when the Holy Spirit comes down and the Son of God is proclaimed by the Father, Satan now knows who he is. And so what happens after that is in Luke, Luke 4, 1 through 13, would you read with me? Then Jesus full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all the time, because he was, and he became very hungry. And then the devil, or Satan, said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. Then Jesus told him, No. The Scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone. Now, I've been to Jerusalem a few times. There is a lot of rocks everywhere. And there's a lot of rocks that look like loaves of bread. So my guess is, Satan's like, hey, you see that rock? Make it into bread. But what Jesus does is this. When Satan says something, he's kind of twisting the scripture. Jesus gives it back perfectly from the Father. And so Jesus says, people do not live by bread alone. Right out of the mouth of God. So then Satan says this. Or the, Satan says this. The devil took him and, uh, up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. 
And Satan says, I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them. And the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I want you to make sure you notice that. They are his to give to anyone he pleases. This is surely God's world and everything. All of us were made by God and we have his fingerprints. Amen? Amen. But let's not forget that Satan has been given authority over a lot of things here. And he can give them to anyone however he pleases. And even as he's talking to Jesus. And let me go on before, or uh, a little bit further. He says, I will give it all to you, verse 7, if you will worship me. And Jesus replied again with the word of God. The scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil took him to Jerusalem to the highest point of the temple. And he said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, he will order his angels to protect and guard you. And they will hold you up with their hands. So you won't even hurt your stone or your foot on a stone. And Jesus responded again with words of scripture. You must not test the Lord your God. When the devil had finished tempting him, he left him until the next opportunity came. Now Satan was tempting, excuse me, tempting Satan, but there was also a test going on, yes? And there was a test going on that we all kind of have. I want to make sure that you notice something, though. Jesus wasn't just presented with some tempting things. The scripture said he was actually tempted. He was tempted. I was praying a few weeks ago and it just hit me that the things I struggle with sometimes seem colossal to me. And I think sometimes maybe God couldn't understand that because I'm sinful and a human like you. Amen. Amen. But it hit me that God said that his son, even though he's well pleased with him, that he was tempted. And so that means it had to be something that tempted him. Right? Now, I don't know what your struggle is. We all have our struggles. But for some people I know, it's chocolate. <laughs> and when I pull out the chocolate, some of the ladies in the room and some of the guys start to salivate a little bit, right? Wow. That's chocolate. But it's not just me up here holding it. For some people, it immediately ignites some kind of a fire, some kind of a passion that maybe they can't even control. Are you still with me? Well, for some people, it's like chocolate. I actually have a daughter who hates chocolate. Who ever heard of that? I know, I couldn't believe it either, but she hates chocolate. I bought her a chocolate cake the other day. She's like, Dad, really? It's my birthday. You, know? you don't know after 21 years that I don't like chocolate? And then I tricked her. I also had a vanilla one too, so it was all good. For some of us, though, it gets a little more serious. Something that maybe is okay for some people in moderation, maybe for you it's not okay ever, anytime. Maybe it's a struggle that you've had for a long time and maybe you still have it. For some people, maybe, <clears throat> maybe it's these. I'm not up here saying you can't gamble. I'm not really preaching about that, John Sevick, but I'm just saying. <laughs> But I'm just saying that if this is a problem for you, you know when you're tempted that you shouldn't go there, and especially if you start taking your family's money, which is not John's case. <laughs> and you start spending it in a way that you are hurting your family, all of a sudden now it's more than just a temptation, it becomes a sin, right? Uh, last week I was preaching about money, really not about money at all, but about the love of money. And for some of us, money is just a thing, we use it to buy, sell, whatever. But for some people, money is the passion of their life. And the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. For some people, it gets a little more serious. We are in a world today, especially around Dayton, Ohio, where we have a serious problem with drugs, especially uh, pharmaceuticals and heroin, etc., and we have people that are devastated all around us because that temptation is not something they can deal with anymore. One time, maybe they fought against it, and sometimes they just acquiesce and they can't do it anymore. And we all have friends there, yes? Yes. And then maybe for some of us, it's the stuff that shows up on our iPads. Or maybe it's somebody in your life that you know that shouldn't be there. You see, what I'm saying is, is that Jesus was actually tempted. And we are actually tempted. Maybe it's none of these things. 
Maybe you know what it is and you fill in the blank, right? But we're, we're sinners, we're people. Let me make sure I tell you this. It's not just sins of commission, things that you do. Sometimes it's sins of omission. omission. The things that we know we should do and we don't do. And sometimes we're tempted not to do the things that we know we're supposed to be doing. Maybe sloth comes in and takes over. Jesus is saying, listen, sin is not temptation, or temptation is not sin, rather. But it can quickly become sin. Read with me this. Jesus' birth was a miracle, but it was his death that would save us from our sins. Amen. Jesus came not to have his birth celebrated. I know that we today in our culture, some of us have Santa and some of us have this and that, but as Christians, we get together and we say, no, this is the birth of Christ and we're going to celebrate that. And I don't think there's any problem with that. But Jesus never came to have his birth celebrated. Once the angels had done it, they weren't doing it anymore. And early Christians did not celebrate the birth of Jesus. They were actually awaiting his return. They just got together and they prayed and they broke bread and they took care of each other and said, he's coming back soon. He's coming back soon. And he is. It's just that God's days and the way he measures time are not the same as we measure. Um, what he can go is to die. He came to die as a Passover lamb and to lay down his life. And so we have these verses, and uh, if you ever watch a football game, you've seen them, and you probably know them. John 3.16 lays out what we call the gospel of Jesus Christ. The reason why it came, the good news, it goes this way. Would you read it with me out loud? For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And there it is. God so loved the world, and because he loved, he sacrificed and whoever believes in that, whoever believes that Jesus is the Son of God, will not perish, but have eternal life. But here's what the problem is, I think, today. A lot of times religious people, and sometimes pastors, and maybe people who mean well, they forget John 3.17. And John 3.17 reads like this. God sent his Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save, save the world. We are not to judge the world. Brothers and sisters, in the church, as a pastor, sometimes I have to sit people down and say, this isn't good, this is not right in your life, and to tell you what's right and what's wrong, let's look at the word, that's not judging, that's pointing to the truth and kind of making a right judgment of it, if you will. But what we do often is we judge the world. How can the world be judged? That's God's job. We're not supposed to be doing that. What we're supposed to be doing is to help save the world through Christ. And so Jesus did a lot of things, including the Passover lamb. But here's a couple things you can take with you if you want to write them down or type them in the app. Number one, he came to save or save the people from the religious crowd. You know, at that period of time, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Jewish ruling council, they had decided that they would take the law to extreme. And what I mean by that is you shouldn't kill, you should murder, all that stuff. But they made it so difficult on the people that no one could stand up underneath the burden. They said you couldn't even carry something, you know, on the Sabbath. And, and, and so what they would do is they would oppress the people with religion. God forbid, Jesus came and said, oh, no, 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 it's not religion that saves you, it's relationship. And so he saved the people that were under God's wrath with grace. He also saved them from the government. Who needs saving from the government? Okay, maybe he didn't stop Roman occupation at that moment in time, but Rome did fall in God's time. Amen? Amen. And Jesus set it up. He also did this, ultimately, he saved them from themselves. When I'm talking about temptation, I know some people will say, well, why are we talking about this on Christmas? Because we are human, and we still have temptations, and we have to be saved from ourselves. Amen? Amen. And Jesus is able to do it. Not because he was perfect, and he was perfect. It's because he was tempted in every way. He knows what it is to be tempted. And friends, I think in the church we forget about that. When something happened that tempted Jesus, he salivated. 
He didn't sin, but he was tempted. And so because of that, he is able to lay down his life, pick up his life again, and then he can become a great high priest. But not like the religious people of the time, not like the pious people of the time, and not even like the Christians of the day who maybe are more than they should be with their attitudes and things of that nature. What he did was he hated all of that stuff, laid down his life, and picked it up again so he could empathize with our temptations and our struggles. Read with me out of Hebrews uh, 4, 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. And that's kind of how it was that day. People didn't, they weren't empathizing with the people. But instead we have one who has been able, or has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Um, God does not tempt us. I want to make sure you know that. But the Holy Spirit may lead us into a place where we are being tempted. And God may actually be behind the scenes there. There are some testings that go in our lives. Anybody been a Christian long enough to know that? Come on now. And like Jesus, whenever Satan opens his mouth, what we need to do is shove it full of God's word. Say, I won't fall for it. It's a lie. It's a trick. But friends, temptation will they will come. If they come to the Son of God, they're going to come to you. And no one is exempt. But when it happens, there's always an escape hatch. Paul says it this way to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation is overtaking you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Like Jesus, um, and in his power, we stand firm. And when we stand firm, God always provides a safety hatch, if you will. And this is what happens. When we stand firm against the temptation in the power of Christ, this is what happens. Blessings. Blessings. If we can just tag into the power of the Holy Spirit and push back the flesh, then what happens is, just like in Christ, Lots of people are blessed, and we're blessed when we stand up against it. And so that's why the testing comes. That's why the tempting comes. So that in the end, we can be blessed. Listen to this, James 2. I'm not just making this up. James 1, 12 through 15. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. I hope you see a picture in there. The carrot, right? The desire comes. That's not the sin. The sin comes when we start to chase it, when we start to pursue it. And what does it always lead to when it's allowed to grow? Death. To death. And ultimately to separation from the God who made us. I know this isn't Christmassy, but it's the truth. Unfortunately, Satan will take some. Satan will take some. There are some people, for whatever reason, have hardened hearts. God is maybe, you know... <laughs> trying to reach out, but they just won't do it. The scripture said they have stiff necks. They will not come. But that is not the case for anyone who calls on the name of the Lord. You may not be a churchgoer, and as a pastor, I think you should do that because you need it. You need it. We all need it. But you don't have to be in the church to be saved from your sins. What you need is to call on the name of Jesus. Romans 10, Paul says it this way. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord... And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never 
be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all that call on him. For everyone, say it with me, who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, I'll give you this as I close. Belief is a Christmas gift like no other. Belief is a Christmas gift like no other. The scriptures say in Romans 3 that no one seeks God, no, not one. And so if you are a believer here today, it's because God has reached out to you and said, here I am. Do you hear me? Can you see me? Do you see my work? And at some point, you've seen and believed. From that point forward, you're supposed to carry that light into the world. It's not an easy task. That's why he calls it a cross. That's why he calls it a burden. Amen? Amen. And yet we're supposed to do it. Have you called on the name of Jesus and asked him to forgive your sins? Have you gone to him with your temptations and said, I can't stand up under this. I need help. Because that's why he died. Not just to give us the gift of salvation and so one day we can get into heaven. He wants us to live those amazing, abundant lives right now. But because of this stuff in our lives, we don't live it. John 10.10, 10, one of my favorite verses, I taught it to everyone in this church. The thief comes to steal, steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that they might have life, abundant life. And not for heaven one day, for now, right now. In a couple of moments here, I'm going to break the bread, and we're going to share in the Lord's Supper. Just a couple of thoughts about this. Number one, the bread is not the flesh of Jesus. Jesus laid down his life once. He lived himself up under his own power, and he's at the right hand of God. He doesn't need to be crucified again. But he said, not remember my birth. He said, remember my death. And so when we break the bread, that's what we're remembering. When we lift the cup, we're lifting it up as a sign which he gave us of a new covenant. Not an old covenant where we had to keep all the letters of the law, but a new covenant where we actually could keep the letter of the law, but it's in his blood that we trust, not in our ability to keep it. Are you following with me? Um, as I do this, this is for believers. If you don't believe, there's no point in it, right? Uh, also, also, it's for people who have thought maybe a little bit about the things in their life, maybe the struggles, the temptations. And I'm not saying you have to have beaten down those temptations, but you have to know where the power is and be calling on Him. And one last thing. We need to make sure that our relationships with one another are unifying. That doesn't mean we accept everybody's sins, but we accept everybody in Jesus' name. Amen. And so if there's somebody who has a problem with you, and they know you're a Christian, and you haven't gotten it right, you might want to let the bread pass and the cup pass. Amen.